hard as nails. Tough, tough, tough. You have to enjoy something about the suffering. He always wants to be pushing himself. Bang. He's going so fast, he's only got sand shoes on. He's attacking him, he's attacking him. I'm gonna be in trouble here. Chris got his revenge, and by God, it was cold-blooded. I know what I'm doing. It's got absolutely nothing to do with doping. How can you be a guy in Nairobi and dream of being any kind of decent cyclist? For me, it feels like pressing the reset button at the end of every year, coming back here. Hey, Wana. Hello, boy. Hey, how are you doing? In this time of year, it certainly doesn't hurt to have a glass of wine, a good steak, a good braai, as they call it out here. What do you still stand in the That was Chris's position on the bike line back in the day. Pretty much the same as it is now. That's it. Most of them are old school friends. They're the ones who convinced me to actually go onto the road and, and start road cycling. Chris is a cyclist. He cycles pretty well. Is he shy? No. I've already blocked the world out of my mind. I can't remember <laughs> that far back. <laughs> We're all different in different company, aren't we? What comes across sometimes in the media is very different from what he actually is. Chris Froome, second last year, is the winner of the Tour de France this time. To see your mate coming past in the yellow jersey, leading the peloton on the Champs-Élysées, it was insane. This boy, who was born in Nairobi, brought up in Johannesburg, races for the UK, has won the Tour de France. It was incredible. I mean, it was crossing that finish line and then having these guys there, obviously, just to remind me of my roots and, and where I came from. I wouldn't say I'm African, but I'd say that Africa has played a big part in my life. It was a great place to grow up as a kid. I mean, there was just so many things to do. Both my brothers had been into snakes. The one that stood out the most was the 12-foot python Jeremy actually brought home, which developed an appetite for my pet rabbits that I'd keep at home. And it's quite interesting to try and put yourself in Chris Room's shoes and stop and see the world through his eyes, because it is, you know, it is out of the ordinary, really. But he quite often would sit down and be telling stories about being chased by rhinos and all these kind of crazy things that most of us find quite hard to relate to unless you've been down to Chester Zoo or something. Even from a, a very young age, I was riding a bike. That was my transport, that was my freedom. The only rule I had with my mother was that I'd be home before dark. The dominant image of, of Chris Froome um, in terms of his African upbringing, his time spent with his mum, which I think was incredibly formative in terms of making him the person he is today. My parents got divorced when I was about six or seven. And it's, I think at, at that kind of age, it's, it's difficult to understand why mum and dad are obviously fighting the whole time. For a few years, I'd get this sort of sick feeling when I'd hear people raise their voices. Eventually, my father moved out. I carried on uh, living with my mother. His mum didn't have a lot of money, and he tells the story about people who look like bailiffs or debt collectors coming to co wanting stuff out of their house. We had some, some colourful times, my mother and I, and my mother always supported my cycling. She let me keep riding and uh, knew that that's, that's what I love doing. She was such a central influence in ensuring that he had the opportunity to pursue what was a a kind of a ridiculous cycling dream. How can you be a guy in Nairobi where the roads are barely rideable on and dream of ever being any kind of decent cyclist? In some ways, I definitely still feel like, like I am a kid, especially when I'm out on the bike and just, just riding still just to enjoy it. We're just off to St. John's College, which was where I came to school as a teenager. I didn't want to leave Kenya. I loved growing up there, but I was able to go to a school that we're going to go have a look at today. I love playing rugby, but I didn't quite have the build for it. <laughs> I got absolutely munched. 
I was able to do my cycling um, <laughs> on the side. Set the alarm normally for 4.30. Technically, I don't think I was allowed out, um, or I wasn't allowed out. Um, I must have had some kind of burning desire to ride a bike because not only would it be um, dark at that, that time in the morning, but it would be absolutely freezing. All right, here we are. Yeah, geez, it's been a while yeah. since I've been back here. Yeah. Ellen, so I remember you. <laughs> Is that just, there we go, that's easy. It's emotional coming back and having all these old memories coming back again. This is completely different. Oh, I wish, uh, wish they had one of these when I was here. My bedroom was at the end, so that was the prefect's room. So I'd creep out of here when everyone was, was fast asleep in the morning. You know, sometimes you turn a blind eye, but um, I know when we started, <laughs> um, our setup didn't allow for cycling between schools, but we had a passion. I did have a bit of an import business, I'd call it, while, while I was at school here. I took my first bet on you. <laughs> <laughs> you were a bit of a businessman back then as well, Chris. <clears throat> we weren't really going to that, but uh, let's just say I'd, uh, I'd keep the borders happy. <laughs> I'd occasionally stop by the liquor store and pick up a few bottles of something or a few cigarettes and keep the guys happy and at the same time be able to pay for my race entrance fee on the weekends. Club. Yeah, we had a little cycling club and this dude arrived. Like, who's With my guy? mountain bike. Yeah. I was extremely privileged to have been brought up the way I was in Kenya and here in South Africa. Knowing what there is on the other side where there's just no infrastructure in Kenya for, for a lot of kids. Chris, welcome. Thanks. I was 14 or so. Come on in, guys. David Kinja was, at the time, the captain of the Kenyan cycling team. My house is full of crap, so that's how we live, yeah. <laughs> All the rims are bicycles and people nothing, and things, yeah. Nothing's changed since yeah. I was here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I wasn't exactly spoiled for choice in Kenya, given that there isn't a, a very big cycling community there at all. Oh, wow. uh, it was actually the mother who approached me after one of our little local races. Chris was there with his little BMX bicycle. And the mother came and said, I want somebody who can teach him how to ride his bike well, how to behave in traffic, and how to fix a flat tire. And I said, fine, that I can do. Yeah, but I didn't know that in Chris Froome's mind was something else. By then I'd started to develop more of an interest in the competitive side of cycling, trying to become fitter, being stronger. I was just hooked. I don't recognize at all where we are now. Everything changes, eh? Everything changed. You know, back then it was just fun. No? He was just one of us. The only difference was the color. I definitely stood out like a sore thumb at that point. His nickname is Morongaro. Yeah, Morongaro means the straight one. Yeah, straight and up. <laughs> Very basic living. Tin huts, no running water, no real toilets or anything, just a, a long drop outside. After a bike ride, you came in, you're maybe six hours out on a trail, you were filthy. When you made yourself as clean as you could, you slept in a bed that was really a single bed. But three people were in that bed, and Chris was one of them. We just got on with it. No one complained about anything. That was just the way it was. Watch out for potholes, guys! That spoke of incredible resilience, and also a guy who so loved the bike that the material circumstances of his life were a complete irrelevance. I definitely wasn't very good at that point. I think I had a lot of motivation, but as an actual bike rider, I didn't have the muscles. I'd get 50, 60 kilometers into a ride and I'd be running on empty, but I, I wouldn't say anything to them. I wouldn't tell them I'm suffering or I'm struggling. He suffered a lot. Yeah, but he says that it was good for him. He says it helped him. So I believe now that it helped him, yeah. I felt really lucky to be able to be in with them and, and, and to be able to ride with them, to be able to stay with them. Now, what was Chris Froome showing when he was spending that time 
on the road with Kinja and staying in the township. Mental toughness, that's probably his, his single greatest characteristic. Love you, Chris. Thanks, Kinja. Thanks a lot. Thanks, man. There's no question that his relationship with his mum was outstanding. I got the call saying that she'd had a heart attack and passed away that morning. I'd like to dedicate this win to my late mother. Which way are we going to go? Um, On the highway, aren't we? I think he's very likeable. If I just go straight here. He's intelligent. He's got a kind of an unusual personality, got a kind of an unusual charm. You don't know you're in the wrong lane, eh? That's the definition of a backseat driver. <laughs> He'll kick all of the way, Chris Froome. Hard as nails. He won't let himself slow down till he hits the line. Tough, tough, tough. This is going to be a stage win and a yellow jersey for Chris Froome. That's probably the perfect speed. It's about 40 kilometers an hour. And obviously, see how it was easy for me coming back from school to just get behind a car or a big truck or something and cruise all the way back home. So you genuinely used to ride your bike on this motorway? Yeah, 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 definitely. It was still definitely the most direct way. No traffic lights all the way, so it was the quickest way, but obviously not necessarily, <laughs> not necessarily allowed. You have to enjoy something about the suffering as a professional cyclist. I remember i had been living in the south of Switzerland in the Alps, these amazing hour-long climbs to go and train on. And Chris telling me that he didn't have them in Johannesburg, so what he would do was pull his brakes to mimic climbing an alpine pass, which would mean pulling his brakes for 20 minutes. I've tried that. I can't keep my brakes pulled for more than a couple of minutes, never mind 20. He always wants to be pushing himself, going right to the limit and then go beyond the limit. It's what's made him the formidable athlete and competitor he is. Just that level of dedication and the acceptance of the suffering that comes with it, I've really not seen in any other rider. And after 10 years in Europe, I've. I know quite a lot of riders. When was the first time you ever heard the name Chris Froome even being mentioned? So I, I remember it quite clearly, actually. And it was at the Commonwealth Games in Melbourne. Our first rider starting to get prepared now. I can remember seeing the guys from England and just their, their shining white kit and amazing bikes. And they were all riding the same bikes, which was just, you could see these guys were professional. His name was on the start sheet. It's not something that jumped out of the page. We've got a huge field ahead of us. We've got 72 riders. I went off in the first wave, and Chris actually went off right at the start of the first wave of riders. And the first rider to lead them out is the rider from Kenya, in Christopher Froome, the fastest out on the course so far. And his splits start to come through. And um, I can remember Shane Sutton going, blimey. There's a bloke out here, he's going so fast, and he's only got the same shoes on. Being the first rider off, I, I got back and had the fastest time on the course, which meant that I was sitting in this hot seat for a good hour with, with all the cameras on me and people talking about me as the race leader. This is Christopher Froome of Kenya. That was the first time that I was on international television, sitting on these hot seats next to Chris, who was really special. Cheers. <laughs> For somebody with the background that he had and where he was at, he caught our eye. First time out of Africa, a guy, he's a university student at this time. So how was he able to compete? Extraordinary talent, that's how, because he had nothing else going for him. Technically, I was, I was terrible. I was, I was crashing all the time. But I think the important thing was that, was that, that I showed I had an engine. The next big thing in my mind was the World Championships. If I could get to the World Championships, that might be a ticket for me onto the professional scene. And so to the under 23 men's individual time trial. I'd previously been helping the, the manager of the Kenyan Cycling Federation to, to send emails. It, it was a bit sneaky of me. I, I, I directly emailed the, the UCI from his account saying, we'd like to enter.
into one rider into the under 23 world champs and and I got myself entered. Another one of my early memories of Chris was sitting in a manager's meeting, a cold, horrible day at the World Championships. And in what was this soaking wet bike ride, and it was Chris. He'd managed to get there on his own, and he was representing his country on his own. He hadn't got a manager. So he came to the manager's, team manager's meeting and sat there. Their only representative, he couldn't work out which way he was going, left or right. He came down the barrier, and it went down, and, and there was a corner straight away. I was a little bit confused as to which way the road went. And when you can't work that out, this is exactly what happens. Just bang straight into him, and he was holding a big pile of papers, which just went straight up in the air. And this guy's throwing his paper. <laughs> it's like see, Chris is, you know, it, it was chaos really. Just a little too much enthusiasm, a little too much adrenaline for Kenya's Chris Froome. Very quickly, I earned the nickname Crash Froome. Having grown up in Africa, it just seemed so difficult, and I thought this, this was one legitimate way that I could get myself onto the Euro European team. That told us a lot about the tenacity of the guy and the desire. There's a character in there which could, be, could fit pretty well in elite sport. Everybody pull your hair back. It really hasn't changed. Who's got the biggest receding hairline wins? He's definitely the best athlete that I've ever had the privilege to work with. <laughs> Thanks, Sai. <si. laughs> Go on! <laughs> Our goal was to get a ride into the Tour de France, and Chris bought into that completely. Huh? It really was a massive step for me signing that contract with Bala World. Definitely didn't mean that I'd made it by any means. Now it just meant that the hard work begun. <laughs> The interesting thing to me about him was that he had this, these enormous amount of hurdles that he had to overcome in order to get to a place which would have been pretty straightforward for other riders to get to. It was in the spring of 2008 that my mother started to fall ill and she'd been diagnosed with, with cancer. It was later on into April, May that it started to get a lot more serious. But at that point, the doctors were optimistic, but things took a turn for the worst. It was a, a week-long stage race in Spain. I, I got the call from, from Jeremy saying that uh, she'd, she'd had a heart attack and, and passed away that morning. My world had come tumbling down, hearing that news, and. It felt as if I was just a, a million miles away riding a bicycle. And I hadn't even been home for over a year. I hadn't been back to see her and I just felt, I felt terrible. She was definitely my, my biggest supporter. I'd like to dedicate this win to my late mother. It's a great shame she never got to come see the tour, but I'm sure she'd be extremely proud if she was here tonight. I wish she could have been around a little bit longer just to, to see how, how things have gone since, since then. The team's inability to see that Chris was the man in the 2011 Vuelta robbed the team and Chris of a Grand Tour. He should certainly have won that race. I think it, it takes a special person to be able to win something like the Tour de France. Look at Chris Froome. Chris Froome is trying to spoil the party. His personality on the bike is very, very different to who he is. You know, he comes across as being quite aggressive. Froome crosses the line, a tremendous show of strength. You know, he's, he's not at all like that in, in person. He's a very soft, yeah, soft-spoken, soft-natured person. False accusation. Oh, that's, your, yeah. that's cool. You know, he's funny, he's, he's, he's quite a character. <laughs> You're blushing. <laughs> uh, just sunburned today. <laughs> he surprises the rest of the guys sometimes by the, um, the pranks and whatnot. 
but then it gets up to. Paintball guns. I always remember him with his paintball guns. Chris would rock up with this crazy gas-powered paintball gun and go around shooting at everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you remember that. They nearly shot me in the eye. Yeah. Chris has got a steely resolve. He really has it. <laughs> the fact that he's got good manners and that he's polite doesn't mean that he's not a leader and that he's not ruthless where he needs to be. He will look at everything pretty clinically, very logical, very hard to argue against, and pretty unemotional. Yeah, I think it's time for us to do a runner. I got a call from Robbie Nelson saying, hey Chris, great to hear the news and uh, good luck to you. And I just turned around to him and said, what do you mean? He said, no, no, you're doing the tour. There's no question that his relationship with his mum was outstanding, but there's also a very single-minded character here. My mother's only just died a week ago. How on earth am I gonna get myself round to, to doing the Tour de France? My mother would have definitely wanted me to, to live my life, to go and do the tour. She would have said, you get on with it and you make the most of it because it's a fantastic opportunity you're getting and don't mess it up. Suddenly to be going into the deep end, into the biggest race of them all, that was quite daunting. And Chris Froome back in 168th position, one of the early starters. That 2008 tour was just a massive eye-opener in, in every way. The racing just felt as if it was 10 kilometers an hour faster than any other race I did. How was it out there today, Chris? Um, hard. Hard. My biggest goal was finishing that tour. I wanted to get to Paris, no matter what happened in between. And we're just police all over our hotel. Moses was being frog marched out of the hotel in, in handcuffs. It was always, oh, it's, it's those guys over there, it must be the bad guys. But for it to happen to my own teammate, just felt scary that it was happening so close to home. And I can just remember the circus outside of the bus, so that next stage, just the mobs of journalists and, and, and media out there. Chris, um, just talk us through this morning's events from your perspective. It's a huge shock to me. I mean, you always hear of doping scandals, but you never think it's going to happen in your team. So it's, it's obviously a disappointment, and I hope it's a mistake. As the tour went on, we started losing one teammate after another. Who's gone down there? There's a rider from Barlow World has gone down there. Maurizio Soler was the first guy to go home. He was our leader. He was who we were riding for in the mountains. This is John Lee Augustine, I think, who's gone off the edge of the road, straight over the top of the climb. John Lee also had quite a big scare. That could have been the end of it for him. Well, that is very sad. Once the race got up into the mountains, I actually started to feel quite good and I'd actually try a little attack here and there. They're chasing Chris Froome. They are indeed chasing Chris Froome. Number 57, Chris Froome, seems to be still in contact with the leaders on this day. The sensation of reaching Paris felt fantastic. Out of nine teammates, I was one of the four who made it. It, it was a great feeling. Chris, you've done yourself great credit. A top 100 finish. <laughs> well, I wouldn't really say that's a great achievement, top 100, but um, it's your getting, first tour, Chris. Getting, getting to the finish is definitely an achievement, I think. It's, it's all just been a huge learning experience for me. It was during that time in Barlowald that I'd swapped the Kenyan racing license for a British racing license. As we started to pull a British team together, it was obvious to us then that Chris would be one of the names that we'd try and attract to the team. At all times, please do keep a good level of communication with us. They gave me a bit of a hard time at first. They asked me if I knew what a Yorkshire pudding was and all that kind of rubbish. You know? <laughs> there was definitely a lot of work to do with me, but I think that they could recognise that I had the talent. The pressure's on, but at the same time, we're in the right kind of environment to be able to handle it. 
2010 was a difficult year for me. It wouldn't be consistent. And then you see another glimpse of brilliance and you think, wow, you know, that you can't do what he did there without talent. Good form and then getting sick. The question wasn't why that happened. The question was more, why isn't it happening all the time? By the end of 2010, I, I thought, hold on, so something's not quite right here. The Bill Hartz here, parasite, feeds on red blood cells. So you can imagine for, for a cyclist and in any endurance athlete who needs red blood cells to recover, to transport oxygen, it was a nightmare, absolute nightmare. And when that diagnosis came, I think it made a lot of sense to a lot of people. At least you know what's going on and okay, now we can move on and treat it and, and, and off we go. Belhazia had held him back. And as soon as he sorted it out, suddenly he was, he was back, but he was even better. Sky isn't interested in, in nurturing people forever. The guy was virtually on his way out of the team in 2011 before the Vuelta. This is Christopher Fromm now from Team Sky. The 2011 Vuelta was a huge turning point in my career. His performance on the 2011 Vuelta, did you see that coming? Yeah, no, that's, that's um, no. A day I'll never forget. I think it was on stage 10. He's found his legs this season. He struggled a little last year and the year before that. I got to finish and I felt like, okay, this has been a good time here. From putting in a brilliant performance. But I'd never expected to be in front of Brad. Wiggins with the grimace on his face, the Union Jack, the British national champion. I remember feeling, I'm going to be in trouble here. It could be from into the red jersey. I'm supposed to be supporting Brad and now I've gone and passed him in the time trial. That's, that's not meant to happen. He looks a little shell-shocked to be in the red jersey. He didn't expect it. I'm not sure too many others did either. Brad didn't say a lot, so it was still a bit like walking on eggshells around him. I'd never won a race in my life. To now leading a Grand Tour, it was just, it was massive. What do you expect for now to the end of the Vuelta? I haven't even had the chance to think about it, to be honest. Um, I was just told 10 minutes ago that I, I'm in red, so... For now, that's enough. Chris, it suits you. Let's see how long you can hold on to it for. Wiggins in second position. We were still riding for Brad, even after I was in the leader's jersey. It did look strange, the, the leader of a Grand Tour, working for the guy who was second. From sacrificing himself as Wiggins now takes control. It was a plan that's worked out perfectly. He was pulling for his teammate when he was a legitimate contender himself. Bradley Wiggins is the new race leader. Britannico, nacido in Kenya. Kobo was in the leader's jersey of the water. Here is Wiggins, who's under pressure. He's showing the signs of fatigue. This was one of the last opportunities for me to try and take that red jersey. Kobo knows the climb better than anybody else. It was a bit of a lull. And that's when I thought, right, this is where I'm going to go for it now. It's a head-to-head -head battle between first and second in the general classification. Christopher Fromm is on the charge. Que duro, que duro. This might be the winning move for the Volta a España. Bueno, 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 peligro que puede haber cambio de líder. I was hoping that because I dropped him, it would mentally just crack Kobo and maybe it'd switch off. But he came back. Kobo has got the support as Christopher Fromm is starting to fade. As he went past me, he picked up the pace even more. I couldn't believe it. I was just so disappointed. I thought I'd won it. He got caught, he got passed, and normally, that's that. Literally on the last left-hand bend up to the finish, he left a little gap on, on the left. As soon as I saw that open, I just thought I have to get through there, to the line first at least. This is an extraordinary day of racing. Christopher Froome wins the stage. He catches Kobo again and attacks again and wins the stage, which was... I don't think anybody was expecting to see that. But that kind of shows you the tenacity and the, his will to win. That was one of the hardest days on the bicycle of my life. And that was impressive. Wow, don't see that very often. There was so much to take in and 
to be a part of that moment. It was years and years of dreaming about trying to win a stage like that in, in the mountains of a Grand Tour. I mean, it's 13 seconds behind, but that's how racing goes. Maybe next time I'll do better. The team's inability to see that Chris was the man in the 2011 Vuelta robbed the team and Chris of a Grand Tour. He should certainly have won that race. He's now delivered on that potential that he's shown for quite a long time. Presented you with a difficult dilemma, didn't it? Because all of a sudden you've got to go and re-sign a superstar at great expense. Yeah. How can one race have changed my life that much that all of a sudden people are wanting to sign me for 10 times what I was on before? 10 times? 10 times, yeah. He signed a, a new contract. It was all systems go about, you know, he, he felt that actually he wants to come win the Tour de France and we wanted to back him to do that. Cycling is a brutal sport. Richie Porte is the man doing that pacemaking. People will only remember the winner. Garrett Thomas now making the pace. Second place, third place, fourth place. It almost counts for nothing in cycling. People turn themselves inside out for each other and they don't even get a mention. Attention, the Britannique is au départ. Nobody can deny Brad's right to be the team leader. I went in there with the understanding that I was going in as a backup GC rider. And like we have two guys who are protected for the yellow jersey. Bradley Wiggins, who wears green today, has been the best tour rider so far this season. It wasn't happening the way I, I'd imagined it would happen. Uh, Chris Froome has dropped back. He knows that every second counts given that the bunch was so big that we could have afforded to, to have a few more guys with me to try and limit that time if I realistically was going to be a backup GC guy there. Look at the speed here. These guys are going absolutely ballistic right now. When he punctured and lost time, obviously he created a, a clear hierarchy. Brad managed to stay in the front. It was a big hit to take on, on stage one of a Grand Tour. Chris Froome thinks that it's wrong that I've lost this because if I had been a protected rider like I should have been, it wouldn't have happened. It was then a collision waiting to happen. The, the first mountaintop finish of the 2012 Tour was La Planche de Belfi. It kicks up violently towards the finish. Look at Chris Froome. Chris Froome is riding away for Sky. This has to be seen as a huge surprise. I looked around at the other guys and no one seemed to really have anything, so it was a perfect moment for me just to get a few metres on them and hold that gap to the finish. Froome crosses the line, a tremendous show of strength. It's quite a double act, isn't it, Froome Wiggins? We saw it on the Vuelta. You've taken it up a notch. <laughs> um, I'm speechless. That really was a dream come true. I never, never thought of winning a stage here. You know, I'm chuffed for Froome because he had misfortune last week and now he's got his stage and obviously he's going to be an integral part to me winning this race. He's in the yellow jersey now. It puts the team in a fantastic position going forward. I'm chuffed a bit. This is absolutely perfect. Brad's been sheltered on the wheel pretty much all the way up this climb. A sterling job of work being done by Chris Froome. I'm going to push on here and see if I can, I can at least try and get back some of that time that I'd lost. When I'd said to him, stay on the wheels, he hadn't said anything back to me, so I, I assumed it was OK. And look at Froome now, oh. who's really hammering it. He's attacking him. He's attacking him. So you attacked? So I attacked. Does Froome know what he's doing with that acceleration? Bradley Wiggins has been left behind. He's just got the word from the team management. You put your own team leader into a spot of bother here, young man. Just sit up and wait for him. I heard, Froome, Froome, I hope you got permission from Brad to do that. Brad on the radio also going, no, 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 no. And at that point, I just thought, OK, whoa, stuff trying to get more time up. I'm going to stay with Brad and make sure he gets to the line with no issues. Bradley Wiggins today keeps his yellow jersey. 
safety had a fight on his hands, but he's got a great team around him. There was so much noise, we couldn't really hear what was going on, and I think when Sean was saying slow, he was thinking we were saying go. It was a stressful period over the next 24 hours. It wasn't a nice feeling in the team. Uh, it was uncomfortable. Bradley's definitely stronger. He's, uh, without a doubt, the, the team leader, and, uh, and we're all here to support him. Before that race, if you'd asked anybody who was the best chance of the team, everybody would have said Brad. But what about Chris's right to compete? Well, the sport doesn't allow that. It has one leader. Chris has got to put up and shut up. That's the very difficult situation that Dave Brailsford had. Yeah, it is what it is. And it, um, you know, I think there's a lot being written about it, a lot being said about it. But, um, you know, I, I was focused on, you know, Bradley winning the race and, um, and ideally Chris finishing second, which is what happened. Everyone just wanted to, to get the job done and, and get to Paris. Bradley Wiggins, the first ever to win for Great Britain. Chris Froome finishes second. It just is all too perfect. A lot of people suddenly had this perception of me that, hold on, this guy is not, not really too kosher. Um, and uh, hopefully I've, I've changed that perception a bit over the last couple of years. This over here is Chris, who has Bjorn Borg underwear. He's the one who will win the Tour de France. There's nothing to say I'll ever win the Tour de France again. Broom down again here. What is going on in the Tour de France this year? That bronze medal in the Olympics was massive for me. Being on the TT bike, going through these crowds upon crowds of people and all just cheering. And not just cheering for the sake of it, you could see they were passionately behind us because we were Brits. Such an amazing feeling. When 2013 started, Chris knew he was going to be stronger than Brad because he had trained like he had never trained. It's been a brilliant season so far for Chris Froome. I wasn't saying that Brad would not be a part of this 2013 Tour de France, but I felt as if he betrayed me a little bit. It didn't feel as if that was what the agreement was beforehand. Chris got his revenge, and by God, it was cold-blooded. The first mountaintop finish of 2013 was Axe Trois-Domaine. Port is dragging Froome away from Alberto Contador. For me to have been able to take minutes and a half on some of my rivals in that first mountaintop finish, that was a big blow to a lot of them. Just look at the face on Chris Froome. That explains to you what kind of agony he's going through this afternoon. He's going to win the stage and take the yellow jersey on stage number eight of the Tour de France. I never really imagined what it would feel like putting the yellow jersey on and then think, OK, I'm leading the Tour de France, the, the biggest race in the world. This is the first big race post Armstrong's admission and life ban. For me, going into that yellow jersey, especially in such a convincing way, did raise a lot of questions. I know what I'm doing, and it's, it's got absolutely nothing to do with doping. It was so vitriolic, and that hostility was there all the time. Where did it come from? In part, Armstrong. No questions in English, please. Given cycling's history, this is just what we're going to have to keep answering, and. My answers aren't going to change. Yeah. I, I know how I've got ready for this Tour de France. I've, I've worked bloody hard for this. He didn't lose his temper. He stayed very, very calm under a fierce barrage of criticism and abuse. Yeah, it was a, it was a tough time, that, actually. 
If anybody thought Chris Froome had won the Tour de France yesterday, they can all think again. The second stage in the Pyrenees, to me, epitomised what he's all about. Froome has got to do everything himself and a long way to the finish. He was isolated, it was a difficult scenario to be in, and he never looked under pressure. Chris Froome safely home in his first day in yellow in the Tour de France, but at the end of it, he lost nothing. I hope he's not superstitious, stage 13 of the Tour de France. The peloton under pressure with the crosswind. A small group got away. Well, Chris Froome has been caught out there, and this is an amazing move by Alberto wow. Contador. And that was a dangerous move. That was a really dangerous move. The guys were tired. We know we're going to take losses today. Let's just try and limit those losses the best we can to the finish. Yes, I'm sure you can breathe a sigh of relief, Mr. Froome, because that was a long, hard day. This climb is so historic. It means so much to this race. Froome has attacked, and Contador's got to hold on. Look at the revving of Froome. Now, I'm amazed at this. Froome is free and away. He's now bringing himself right up alongside Quintana. Oh, he's gone. gone. He has seen Quintana crack. Froome is taking yellow to the summit of Mont Ventoux. Bastille Day, finishing up on top of Mont Ventoux. It doesn't get much bigger than that in, in the Tour de France. Chris Froome building his lead over everyone. <laughs> I really didn't see myself winning that stage today. I, um, I really can't believe it. The guys came over at the end of the tour. You guys watched the last few stages. Check the Kenyan flag. Where? Yeah. Other side. Hey. I wasn't relaxed at all at that point. He's the one who will win the Tour de France. When he came past, we all burst into tears. It was crazy emotional. It was the most emotional was thing ever. I was nervous about getting through the day. I don't think happiness quite describes it. No, never in doubt, <laughs> never in doubt. This is an amazing feeling to be standing here today. Throughout the tour, I'd been scrutinized by the media about doping, and I wanted to say to people, listen, you can believe in me. Thank you to all the people who have taken their time to teach and mentor me over the years. This is one yellow jersey that will stand the test of time. I wake up in the morning and I blink a few times and just think, hold on a sec, I, I, I managed to win the Tour de France. There's nothing to say I'll ever win the Tour de France again. It's extremely rare that you go through a Tour de France without crashing. I mean, I didn't even have time to react. It just happened so quickly and before I knew it, I was on the ground. And it is the defending champion, Chris Froome, who has hit the deck. I could feel that something was wrong here. It was painful to hold the bike. Defending champion of the Tour de France no. we're looking at here. He's ridden through the pain barrier before. Froome down again here. What is going on in the Tour de France this year? But three falls in two days proved too much for a battered and bleeding Chris Froome. It was a massive blow having to leave the tour like that. It's obviously very, very disappointing and, and devastating for Chris. Can we... Yeah, okay. Chris, how hard is it to be going home in these circumstances? Uh, obviously, I'm bitterly, uh, hugely disappointed. But what could I do? This is cycling, this is part of the game. Thank you. Great champions, will they win, but they lose along the way as well. We're a long part of that journey and then, and then the rest is to be played out. I'd like people to remember me as the cyclist who raced with heart. Chris Froome never knows when to say no. I started off on a mountain bike down the Rift Valley just outside of Nairobi and to have gone from there to winning the Tour de France in such a short period of time, I'd love to think that it can serve to inspire a lot of youngsters to do the same. In five years' time, they're going to be over in the Tour giving me a hard time. <laughs> Christopher Froome. He is very driven, he's very tenacious. And, Parti. You know, I think he has got the mindset to be a multiple Tour de France winner. The sacrifice that goes into winning a Tour is immense, isn't it? It's unbelievable. If I 
If I think back and think of the journey I've taken to get here and the, where I started, it's just really special. There are so many people who have made so many sacrifices and, and taught me so much along the way. I really owe them a lot of thanks and I hope they can share in this with me too. You've got what it takes, I think, to have a spectacular journey over the years. Let's wait and see.